and welcome to this virtual press conference on the Racial Equity Congressional Redistricting Map. Uh, thank you for joining us via Zoom or via Facebook where this is also streaming. I just wanna check and confirm I have good audio quality. Can I get a thumbs up from a panelist on the? Great, maybe not. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Matthew Duffy. I'm the Special Counsel for Redistricting at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. I'll be moderating our discussion today. Um, before we begin, I want to let everyone know that all of the information we are discussing here today is going to be available at njisj.org slash redistrictingnj. And that includes PDFs, images of our map, shape files, and community of interest maps. The one thing you will not find there right now is a live version of our Maptitude map. Um, we chose to draw our map in Maptitude because that is what the commission uses. That's what we wanted to use. Uh, just to be totally transparent, we are still having a few technical issues and we are working on getting that up as soon as possible, working very closely with them. So as soon as that is available, we will let everyone know and we hope it will be very soon. Uh, we have a number of incredible individuals and organizations who will be speaking today. However, our Racial Equity Map Coalition uh, who have signed on in support of this map is much broader than just who is on this call. We wanna recognize them up front. So members of our coalition include the Association of Black Women Lawyers New Jersey, Fair Share Housing Center, Faith in New Jersey, the Inclusion Project at Rutgers Law School, the Latino Action Network, Latino Coalition of New Jersey, League of Women Voters New Jersey, Make the Road New Jersey, the NAACP New Jersey State Conference, New Jersey Alliance for Women Justice, New Jersey Appleseed, New Jersey Black Issues Convention, New Jersey Citizen Action, the New Jersey Chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, New Jersey Working Families Party, Seek American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or SALDEF, Salvation and Social Justice, and the United Black Agenda. Uh, after today's schedule remarks, we are going to make time for a Q&A session. We are planning or hoping on ending at 5 p.m. If you have additional questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to any of our panelists. Uh, and I know they would be more than happy to answer those. Also, please use the Zoom's Q&A function, not the chat, to place your questions. We are going to be monitoring the chat and we'll also be monitoring our Facebook page, but we cannot guarantee we will see your question if you do not put it in the Q&A function. So please do your best to put it there. And uh, one final note before we substantively begin, something we heard from our panelists would be helpful. Uh, we'd love to quickly define communities of interest. We will be talking a lot about communities of interest. It's a major theme with this map. And communities of interest are quite simply a group of people who have common policy concerns and would benefit from being placed in a single district. Very often they're racial or ethnic communities um, and they constitute you know, cultural and social and economic links together. And they wanna to speak together in the next round of maps. So we'll be speaking a lot to communities of interest during this session. Uh, with that, I would love to turn it over to Hemel Patel, the Director of the Democracy and Justice Pillar at the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, who is going to be providing an overview of this map and how it came together. Hemel? Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. We're so excited about this map, this racial equity map that we put together. Um, all of our partners came together and um, listened to the community listen to the testimony that we are all hearing um, is publicly available and try to come up with a map that actually best uh, best represents New Jersey and our diversity. So as uh, Matt mentioned, my name is Hanel Patel. I'm the director of the Democracy and Justice Program at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. We're a legal advocacy organization focused on racial and social justice. We're here today to talk about redistricting. The purpose of redistricting is to ensure that we have a government that is representative of the people. It's the foundation of our democracy, of our form of government. At its core, redistricting is about power. We appreciate very personally at this point how difficult drawing a map is. It's not a puzzle we can work to solve together. There's no right answer at the front of a box. Um, but what it is, it's about balancing a number of criteria, some legally required, and coming up with a map that best represents the criteria you prioritize. This map that we're talking about today meets all the legal requirements established by Supreme Court precedent, the state and federal constitutions, and of course, the Monumental Voting Rights Act. After those requirements, 
our partners and we prioritize racial equity and communities of interest as Matt just defined. So we have our majority black district and a majority Hispanic district. And I'll go into those a little bit in a few minutes. But crucially, racial equity, communities of interest require not just meeting the requirements of the Voting Rights Act, but going beyond them. In the past, New Jersey has ignored this issue. In 2010, the congressional map, the one we're talking about today, that was certified included only three districts draw, that were drawn to be majority people of color. So in a state that at that time was over 40% people of color, 75% of our districts were drawn to be majority white. Now, when the state is over 48% people of color, we must not let that happen again, particularly when all, all of the population growth in the state has come from people of color. If you're following this issue in the news, you might have seen that the DOJ just sued Texas because they drew new districts that did not reflect the population growth that predominantly came from people of color. Those are the types of issues we're dealing with today. In fact, due to systemic undercounts of communities of color in the census, we may already be a majority of people of color state. According to the Census's Diversity Index, New Jersey has become one of the most racially diverse states in the country, more so than New York, Florida, or Georgia. We must have a map that no, we must not have a map that overrepresents white communities. Instead, we must have a map that allows Black, Latino, and Asian people in the state to use their power. Um, so today, now going into this map, we, we are so excited to present it to you. I'm going to have um, our colleague and friend Philip Hensley from the League of Women Voters share his screen, and I will go through how we drew this map together. We did present this map to the commission on Sunday. It has been submitted to them. Um, and today we are making it available. As was mentioned earlier, it is on our website in PDF form and you could download the shape files. So how did we come up with this map? Well, we listened to the community, both in testimony and when we did community outreach with various partners, state level and locally. So let's start with, we're gonna start today in South Jersey where our district one is. Our district one here, as you can see, um, I will just to make a note, the, the screen that Philip is sharing is on Maptitude. As M Matt said, we are using Maptitude because it is what um, the commission is using. And Maptitude, this is our district one. Our district one includes um, important communities of interest. First, it's still anchored by Camden, which is what the current district one is, and that was important to keep that. We also got a community of interest map drawn by our friends at the NAACP and the Delta Sigma um, Theta uh, sorority who mentioned that they have a community of interest in Camden, Pensacon, and parts of Merchantville, Merchantville. So we kept them together. We also heard from students at Rowan University who felt strongly that they should be part, they should remain part of District 1. We also listened when, uh, with our partners at the NAACP who noted that Salem City, which is a majority black city, wanted to be in a district that included Camden. So that is how we came up with our district one. Moving to district two, we heard from members of the Latino community that there is a significant Hispanic population in Vineland, Millville and Bridgeton. And those three municipalities should not be split up because that would be dividing their community. So we kept them together in District 2. District 2 also includes much of the Jersey, a lot of the Jersey Shore going um, pretty far north, as many of you probably recognize, the Jersey Shore is a community of interest in and of itself. Our District 3, if you see it, it is, we heard from a lot of people on the ground over there that for uh, you know the areas of Burlington County and parts of Camden County are diverse suburbs of Philadelphia. They share a community of interest. So we kept a district three that focuses on those areas. Um, and unlike the current map does not go all the way down to um, all the way um, east to the shore. Our, our district four, if we um, scrolling up a little bit, um, has much of Monmouth County in it. We heard some testimony, uh, we heard some um, feedback from the community that brick should be kept together and our district four does that. Um, now I'm gonna move to, <coughs> excuse me, Central Jersey. 
as you, if you are familiar with our map in New Jersey, you know that while we have districts one, two, three, and four in South Jersey, district five is all the way in North Jersey. So we're gonna focus right now in talking about district six and 12, um, which is what they, this is broadly where they are in the um, current map as well. Our district six, you know, it's an interesting district where we received a lot of feedback. First and foremost, our current, um, the current map similarly goes down to the Jersey Shore, but it shops, stops short and does not capture all of that community there. We heard from communities on the ground and they testified to the public, including yesterday when um, um, the pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Asbury Park told the commission that, you know what, Neptune and Neptune City, they are part of that same community with Asbury Park and the current map splits them up and it hurts and it harms your community. So our District 6 includes that and puts that community back together. We also heard from the Latino population there that they're, they're, the significant Hispanic populations in Long Branch, Asbury Park, and Perth Amboy wish to be in the same community, that they share an interest, a water interest, more so than they do with um, areas um, inland. So that's a lot of this part of District 6. But the rest of District 6, we drew to accommodate the significant Asian population in New Jersey. Our map, this is the first, as we discuss, um, going north to south, the first majority people of color district that we have in this map. This map reflects the growing Asian population that is over 10% of the state um, and the fastest growing demographic, but has been long, long underrepresented in our both federal and state maps. Currently, this area, this entire, the, these towns are split, cracked among three districts. Here, instead, on, in District 6, the Asian population is over 25%, so a, a genuine influence district. Turning over to District 12, our second majority people of color district um, that we drew. District 12 is still anchored by Trenton, an important aspect for Trenton, um, who has been anchoring the district, um, currently does and wanted to continue to do so. But this district also incorporates some communities of interest we received. One, from the Greater New Brunswick um, chapter of the NAACP, we heard that their community is New Brunswick, Highland Park, and Franklin. Frank and currently they are divided. We put them together in District 6. While we put together, well, when we shifted um, New Brunswick, we also included Piscataway because we can't split Rutgers up. That would be splitting up that community of interest, which means our District 12 includes Rutgers, Princeton, TCNJ, and Ryder University, a true, wherein college students are going to have a community of interest here shared in this district. One last part about District 12 is the town of Plainfield. Plainfield is a majority people of color town. We spoke to community leaders there. They felt strongly that they did not wish to be put in a majority white district, that it was important to them to stay in a majority people of color district, which the District 12 is. District 12 currently has and will continue to have in our map a significant black and Hispanic, a significant black and Hispanic population. As we move up, in New Jersey, we have District 7. You may have heard a great deal of testimony from people in District 7 stating um, who felt strongly that District 7 should remain a competitive district. This district does. It looks similar to the current one, um, but it, it remains a competitive district. As we move up, we'll go to District 10 and 11. Our District 10 is our VRA majority black district just as the current District 10 is. A couple of notes on this district. The first being, we use, under the census, there's different demographics you could use. We use all parts Black. That's a specific term. Why did we use that? Because whilst race is complicated and race is a social construct, for purposes of redistricting, we use data from the census. And the census is how people self-identify. So it was important for us to use the data of everyone who self-identified as Black or African American in the state of New Jersey. Crucially important in a state like ours with a significant Afro-Latino population. So it is that number we use to draw this district. 
It is also a district that is over 50% voting age population black, which is also crucial for us to draw and meets um, a current law of uh, current legal requirements for uh, VRA districts. Our District 11, so as I mentioned, that is the third majority people of color district, the majority black district, District 10. Our District 11 is a new majority people of color district that we drew. This incorporates going from the Western part of it, Dover and Morristown. We heard from community members there that Dover shares a community of interest with Morristown. Dover, a majority, um, a, um, a city with a significant Hispanic population shares an interest with being in a, um, the same district with Morristown. We also heard from our friends at the Alpha Phi Alpha um, fraternity who drew a community of interest that included Morristown and Morris Township, that that is their community, which we incorporated here. Growing West, we, um, growing East, going East, we include a lot of the law, um, a lot of the towns, commuter towns that go into the city. But crucially in this district, this district is also represents is a second Asian influence district, which has a popular, uh, which has a district, uh, which has a population of over 20% Asian. As we move up, we have, or I should say, move a little east and up, we have districts eight and nine. District eight is the current and remains in our map, the majority Hispanic district. District um, eight is anchored by Hudson County as it currently is, which was important to maintain and is, as I mentioned, voting age population wise, over 50% voting age population Hispanic, also to, um, in compliance with legal, um, with, uh, with current law. Our District 9, on, so this is this uh, District 8, another majority of uh, people of color district. So that's the fifth. And nine is our sixth majority people of color district. Yes, I'll repeat that. We drew six majority people of color district to, uh, to reflect the growing diversity of the state, a state that is almost half people of color should be well represented in this map. What is our District 9? District 9 is a district that is accommodates the growing Hispanic population, which is 22% of the state of New Jersey. And it, in this District 9, it, it is a true plurality Hispanic district where the, the, um, the demographic with the largest population is the Hispanic population, which is over 40% of this district. And then finally, we have District 5 which is a, it looks similar to the current District 5 and remains a competitive district. So those are our, broadly speaking, our map. Um, and as I said, our big priorities here, as I started with, were communities of interest that I hope you all see, uh, saw us mention um, throughout, this, um, throughout this map process and racial equity. In a state like ours, which is just by census data, over 48% people of color, likely already a majority people of color state and has been historically underrepresenting people of color, it is crucial for us to have six districts, half the districts be majority people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I would now turn it over to Philip Hensley, the Democracy Policy Analyst at the League of Women Voters New Jersey. So take it away. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Hennel, for walking us through that district, um, very helpful for everybody to sort of orient themselves. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Hensling, and I am the Democracy Policy Analyst with the League of Women Voters of New Jersey, as Matt mentioned. Um, the League of Women Voters of New Jersey has been at the forefront of the fight for fair maps for many years, working alongside like-minded organizations to advocate for an impartial, transparent, community-driven, and fair redistricting process. So the League has consistently endorsed three fair mapping principles that steered the creation of this map. First, racial equity. Second, the preservation of communities of interest. And third, that districts are not drawn to favor or disfavor any candidate, incumbent, or political party. This map was not produced by any one personal organization, but reflects input from a wide array of statewide and national partners who share these mapping principles. We also worked with local organizations to conduct community mapping sessions to inform our map making choices. Hennel mentioned many of them. The League of Women Voters of New Jersey is grateful for all of these partners, as well as individual members of the public for their participation in the redistricting process. Working with our partners here today, we drew a map that reflects New Jersey as it is after the 2020 census. Our state is becoming increasingly diverse 
and our map should reflect that fact. This is simply a matter of fairness. A fair map ensures that the voices of New Jersey's growing Black, Latino, and Asian communities will be heard in the political process. A fair map ensures that communities of color are not cracked or packed and that their voting strength is not diluted. When communities are drawn together, whether that's Asian American communities in Mercer and Middlesex counties or the Latino community in the greater Patterson area or the black community in greater Newark, their voices can be heard. These communities are able to receive the resources and representation that they have been too often denied. This racial equity map creates six majority people of color districts out of 12. That's one more than the current five, ensuring fair and accurate representation. This is in accordance with the 2020 census, which found New Jersey is 52% non-Hispanic white and 48% Hispanic, Black, Asian, Native American, and Pacific Islander. As Hannah mentioned, though, due to systemic undercounts, you know, these communities of color likely constitute more than 50% of the state's population. They should account for 50% of the districts as well. Finally, in addition to achieving a racially equitable result, we checked our map against objective tests of partisan fairness. This map is not a gerrymander favoring either party and draws competitive districts when not in conflict with our other priorities. We strongly urge the commissions to prioritize racial equity when drawing the lines, and we continue to request that the commission make their proposed maps public and allow for public testimony on their proposal prior to certification. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to Chris, Chris Estevez, president of the Latino Action Network. Thank you, Matt. Um, the Latino Action Network is a broad, a broad statewide coalition of Latino organizations dedicated to the political empowerment, social to political empowerment, social justice, the promotion of civil rights, and the elimination of disparities in various areas, including education, health, housing, and employment. Our mission is to advance the equitable inclusion of the diverse Latino communities in all aspects of American society. And it's, that, it's with that in mind that the Latino Action Network worked really hard with um, all of our allies in the struggle for racial, social, and economic justice to come up with a map that includes, that, that includes the fair representation of New Jersey's communities of color. Our activities included community education and community mapping sessions. And here's what we found. You know, New Jersey's non-Hispanic white um, the population decreased significantly while communities of color increased significantly. And leading that increase um, of, of communities of color population was the Latino community. And we know from all of our work over the past decade plus that Latino communities and other communities of color face unique challenges in New Jersey, a state with some of the worst racial disparities in the country across almost all indicators of well being, including housing health, education, wealth, just to name a few. Um, I'm here to say that the Latino Action Network supports the racial equity map that we're presenting. While individual groups could draw congressional districts in a vacuum that give their own group the biggest advantage, the Latino Action Network understands that we are not working in a vacuum and that we must all work together to come up with a congressional map that gives us all an opportunity to rise together. Therefore, we support the, the um, uh, racial equity map for the following reasons. This map um, really does uh, acknowledge the fact that, that the communities of color make up almost, if not more than half of the state's uh, population now, and therefore half of, the, um, half of the map should reflect this diversity. So we're very happy that we were able to demonstrate that we, can, we were able to come up with six majority minority districts um, in uh, Congressional District 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, as has already been described. Um, congressional, as has already been said, Congressional District 8 is a Latino majority district and Congressional District 10 is a black majority district. Um, you know, we, you know, Latino Action Network has, is happy as well that, that Latinos are well distributed through this, through this map and that we are not um, we are not absent in any of the 12 New Jersey districts. Um, in, CD, in Congressional District 8, uh, Latinos make up the majority. Um, in, in Congressional District 9, Latinos make up the plurality, meaning that uh, Latinos are the single largest group, um, including uh, larger than the white population in, in Congressional District 9. And Congressional District 12, which is a majority minority district, 
um, that is made majority minority majority minority by a coalition of the different populations. Latinos make up 23.8% uh, of uh, the largest single minority group, uh, while uh, whites, but white, whites uh, continue to be the overall um, uh, the single largest group at 42.1%. And in, in congressional districts six, 10, and 11, where Latinos do not um, lead the pack in terms of minority groups, we still make up a significant portion of those populations. With um, in, in Congressional District 6, we make up 20% of the population. In Congressional District 10, we make up 20.3% of the population. And Congressional District 11, Latinos make up 20.9% of the population. And and we're not left out of the other the other six um, the other six districts either. Um, Latinos continue to be represented in Congressional District 1 at 14.9%. Congressional District 2 at 17.5%, um, District 3 at 9.5%, District 4 at 10.6%, District 5 at 11.5%, and District 7 at 15%. So it's important to us that we continue to be represented everywhere in the state since we do make up such a large uh, portion of the population. Um, and, and we feel that this map demonstrates that it, that can be done. Um, so, just want to. So this map clearly demonstrates that this commission can draw a map that maximizes the number of majority minority districts that do not dilute the voices, our voices, in other parts of the state. And it's important to maximize the voices of people of color in every district because it enhances our ability to fully participate in the democratic process, having an increased ability to elect candidates of our choice. And electing candidates of our choice does not always mean that we elect a candidate of color. Um, districts that include a significant number of people of color tend to create an atmosphere where candidates find it necessary to speak to the needs of a diverse population. And we, we, and we need every member of New Jersey's congressional delegation to take the needs of our state people of color seriously and to fight for, to fight for us as vigorously as they do for the rest of their constituents. A fairly drawn map gives people of color a strong voice in every congressional district in New Jersey, and this racial equity map um, does just that. That is why the Latino Action Network wholeheartedly supports the racial equity map. We urge um, that the members of the, the commission um, take this, this map seriously, and, um, and, we, and, we, and we will continue to work with the commission um, to, to advocate for the inclusion of the priority set forth in this map um, so that our communities, uh, not just the Latino community, but those of all of our coalition um, are heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I would now like to turn it over to Reverend Eric Dobson, Deputy Director of the Fair Share Housing Center and a member of the United Black Agenda. Eric. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> and thank you uh, to my brother, Chris. It's always great to follow Chris. Um, as a member of United Black Agenda, Fair Share Housing Center is proud to stand in the, with the coalition and partners to support this racial equity map presented to the Congressional Redistricting Commission this week. According to the most re recent survey uh, census data, New Jersey is now almost 50% people of color. It is time for our congressional representation to reflect that diversity. Now, we all know that New, New Jersey is still one of the most segregated states in the nation. Black communities and communities of color face unique challenges in our state. Racial disparity between white and black people in New Jersey are significantly among the worst in the nation. People of color in New Jersey fare worse when it comes to housing, wealth, education, and health, just to name a few. So the racial equity map presents this week uh, prioritizes community of color by creating six majority uh, people of color districts, half of the congressional district, which is represented of our state's population. Congressional districts should be drawn to keep communities of interest together so they can exercise their power to elect a congressperson that will best represent their interests in DC. So reflecting on one of those communities of color um, in District 10, we heard from our folks up in Montclair, Montclair NAACP, um, who stressed the importance of them staying in the district in District 10. And we wholeheartedly heard their arguments and their um, their need to be in that district. Shout out to William Scott, one of our NAACP members up in Montclair. So 
Um, as Fairshire Housing Center, um, as United Black Agenda, we look forward to working with our partners to advance, to advocate for the principles this map reflects. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I would now like to turn it over to Amy Torres, Executive Director of the New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. Amy. Thank you, everyone. Um, Amy Torres with New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. We are a statewide coalition of over 45 member organizations that fight for policies that empower and protect immigrants. And I start with that introduction because empower and protect is really at the heart of what we're trying to do with redistricting. How can any community fight for fair public policies or our fair share of resources without fair representation? Now, often when immigrant rights, group, inter, immigrant rights groups enter democracy conversations, we hear the common refrain, what do immigrant communities stand to gain in a conversation that is meant for voters? But if you look at how our communities are prioritizing public policy debates, I wouldn't blame you for making that assumption. The truth is that New Jersey, just like the rest of the United States, is growing in its diversity. Here in New Jersey, we have one of the highest percentages of immigrant communities to total state population. We're second in the nation, outpacing states like New York, Texas, and Arizona that more regularly grab headlines for immigration policy news. But it's here in New Jersey, here where one in four residents is foreign born, here where a quarter million citizens of voting age uh, live with an undocumented household member. It's here where people of color make up 48% of the population, here in New Jersey where our communities, first generation immigrants, their second and third generation uh, families live, and here in New Jersey where we have an opportunity for a change. Now that stat, which we keep mentioning, the 48%, the 2020 census found that New Jersey's population is growing, and as Hennel mentioned earlier, that growth is entirely thanks to communities of color. That's Black and Pan-African diaspora communities that have both been here for generations and are continuing to come here in first wave arrivals. That's also, as Chris mentioned, Latino communities, both first gen and those who are second and third gen moving to other parts of the state. There's also the fastest growing group nationwide, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, a broad racial category that on its own hails from over 40 countries and speaks over 100 languages and dialects. That growth is also Middle Eastern and North African communities who have long been part of Muslim American communities here in New Jersey, but are rendered invisible in census data because they aren't provided a proper categorization um, on the census. But growth is not the only thing that these communities share in common. Our other commonality is whether we're packed, cracked, or have our voting rights under attack, these communities have faced historic and regular erasure from fair representation. And that's why we're an incredibly proud member of this allied space um, and extraordinarily proud that this process has allowed us to draw six majority people of color districts. But much of this information you already know, right? Because this trend didn't happen overnight. Even if you didn't know the stats, you knew that change was already here because you see it in your communities every day. You felt it when you've had to go to the table time and again for what seems like a diminishing pool of public resources and programs. You know where your community lives. You know you're not going anywhere. And with this map, we know that we can be drawn together and we can get what we deserve in, in our fair share and our fair representation. But here's what we don't know. We don't know when the commission will deliver their map. We don't know if their districts will center our communities of interest and communities of color in the same way. And we don't know if once that map is released, whether the public will have enough time to react and weigh in. So we're urging you to stand with us if you're on this call, we urge you to plug into the groups that are here and the groups that have signed onto the map. We know that the energy and the will is here and we're ready to bring the fight with you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Next up is Kieran Gill, Executive Director of the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you to everyone here. Um, as Matt mentioned, I am, uh, my name is Karen Corgill. I'm the Executive Director of the Sick American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or SALDEF. We are a national Sick American civil rights and advocacy organization with deep ties to the Sick, South Asia, Asian American, and Pacific Islander communities across the state. As someone from Central Jersey, it is clear that the AAPI representation in New Jersey 
does not reflect our population currently. And the most recent census demonstrates that. AAPIs are the fastest growing population in the state, an increase of 44%. One in 10 New Jerseyans is AAPI. The racial equity map recognizes the growth of the AAPI population centers across the state, and it creates significant AAPI districts in New Jersey 6 and New Jersey 11, both of which have over 20% AAPI population. It also creates large Asian minority districts in NJ5, NJ7, NJ8, NJ9, and NJ12, all have populations that are at least one in 10 AAPI in keeping with the findings of the 2020 census. I'd like to highlight Middlesex County. It is 25% AAPI per the 2020 census, but the current district lines don't reflect this concentration. In the new map, Middlesex is kept intact and part of the new sixth district, which is 26% AAPI in line with that county's population. The new NJ6 is a majority minority Asian influence district a first in New Jersey's history. Over the past 10 years, I've seen the South Asian community make a huge impact in the central New Jersey region. As a business owner, I've been amazed by the growth and success of South Asian American owned businesses. They've created a significant number of jobs and I've seen the growth in the houses of worship and community centers. We've also seen the community invest in its schools and infrastructure. Similarly, the South Asian, Chinese, and Korean populations grew significantly in the new NJ5 and NJ11, comprising Essex, Bergen, and Hudson counties. For the 2020 census, Bergen had the second highest API community in the state. It is important that the new districts represent this strong growth in diverse communities, and the new NJ11 does just that with 22.5 API population. The racial equity map reflects the growing political power of the API community, we're proud to see that the APA voice and community needs are represented in this map and are part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. Next up uh, is Todd Edwards, the Political Action Chair of the New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP. Todd? Todd, you're muted. Better. You're good. Good, thank you. I want to thank everyone who was absolutely a part of this wonderful team of uh, creating the racial equity map. I mean, when I tell you the full state was represented, I represent true South Jersey being born and raised in Cumberland County and doing high school in the Salem County area. So when I tell you there was input throughout from the very tippity top to the very bottom of the state, and that was real partnership, and I appreciated that. Um, everyone's voice was absolutely heard in this mapping. Um, and I'm just going to speak on a few examples that uh, Hendel touched on. Our youth and college branch from the NAACP felt it at Rowan University felt it absolutely instrumental that they stayed in the first there at Rowan. And that was accomplished in this map. Also, our NAACP in New Brunswick area, they wanted to keep New Brunswick, Highland Park, and Fairfield Township together. That was accomplished in this map. NAACP has multiple partnerships, but we have one with what we call the Divine Nine, which were our Delta Sigma Theta. They were very instrumental in our Camden, Pensalkin, and Merchantville staying together. So when I tell you it was a great pleasure and honor to be part of this team, to know that all of us in this whole state were represented. I greatly appreciate it. All the effort, the long, tireless nights. People have no clue what this team absolutely put together uh, and how they put it together. So I'm very appreciative of being part of this. And I just wanted to say thank you. That's all we have at the NAACP. Thanks, Doug. Uh, we are one for our QA. Or am I missing anyone? No. Great. Uh, those aggressive one minute warnings I was typing in the chat to the panelists clearly worked. Uh, so we have 15 minutes left over for q and I just wanna, I wanna answer just a couple of them. We have four minutes in the chat right now, uh, or in the Q&A session right now. Um, one, everyone's- Hey, sorry, Matt, you're coming in and out in the audio. So I don't know if you wanna just step a little closer. All right, people hear me better? Better version of my giant face. That's great for everyone watching. Uh, 
Um, so gonna quickly give everyone's name on the panel right now, and then I'm gonna give them the opportunity to put their contact information in the chat uh, if they would like to be reached out to by anyone. So just as a refresh. Um, here in the panel, we have Henel Patel, Director of the Democracy Pillar at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Uh, we have, uh, can you mute yourself? Thank you. Uh, we have Philip Hensley, Democracy Policy Analyst at the League of Women Voters, New Jersey. Chris Estevez, President of the Latino Action Network. Reverend Eric Dobson, Deputy Director of the Fair Share Housing Center and a member of the United Black Agenda. Amy Torres, Executive Director of the New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. Karen Gill, Executive Director of the Seek American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And Todd Edwards, Political Action Chair, New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP. I'll allow them to put their confirmation or contact information in the chat. Um, and then the one other question I wanted to answer uh, in the Q&A real quick was, were there any districts added or taken away? And the answer to that is no. Uh, we retain 12 congressional districts in New Jersey due to wonderful work being done by many of the organizations here on this panel, um, getting people to turn out for the census. So uh, New Jersey was able to, not, there was a threat of New Jersey losing a congressional seat, but that did not happen. We're gonna have 12 districts uh, for the next 10 years, just like we had for the last few years. Next question I wanna turn over to you is to Henno, which is on the, uh, how the map was put together and whether the addresses of current incumbents were used as an input to the map. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who's still with us. I'll just say the short answer is no. <laughs> um, a little longer uh, to explain, no, we did not look into where current incumbents are living or where they'd like to stay. The, uh, for us, our focus is just not about the incumbents or anyone who might be challenging them. It's about the people of the state of New Jersey. It mattered to us more what Black people in Camden and Pensacola, Black people in New Brunswick, and Neptune were telling us, um, and Montclair was telling us, then where individual incumbents were living. Um, we, you know, they can handle their own political, <laughs> their, their own political uh, decisions. And for us, it's about making sure we have a representation for the diversity of the state of New Jersey. Uh, we also had a question about CD10, and I'd like to throw that one over to uh, Philip Hensley at the League of Women Voters. Sure. Um, thanks, Matt. So we've got a question about the, the small part of Northwest Bayonne in, in District 10. Is it because of the, the Bay Bridge? Um, so the the current, we, we made a lot of changes uh, in our map compared to the, the current lines. Um, but I will note that the current District 10 does include that part of Bayonne um, and it does cross over the river um, where, where the bridge is. So um, our map replicated that. Um, it is uh, legally permissible to connect districts um, by, by water, but when you can avoid it, we like to avoid it. Um, so that was the rationale um, for, for maintaining what currently exists in our map. Um, thanks, Philip. There was also a question on uh, Progression District 5 that I think you said you might be able to answer. Yeah, so we had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I, I'll scroll up. Frank asks about the rationale for District 5. Um, I, I wanna make one quick correction. You're saying it includes the wealthy parts of Bergen with very rural areas of Sussex and Warren. So the, the current CD5 does just that. Our district is slightly more compact. Um, it, it doesn't include Warren County. So at Bergen, Passaic uh, and Sussex. Um, and, you know, there are lots of different ways. And honestly, we, we spent a lot of time working on district five and district 11 and, and lots of considerations um, were put in there. I think, um, as I mentioned in, in my remarks, um, one interest that we considered was when you can have uh, a competitive district um, that's not in conflict with some of the other priorities. Um, we've heard a lot of people testify that competitive districts are important uh, for representation. So this fifth district um, is a slightly more compact version of the fifth compared to the existing districts, doesn't have Warren, um, but keeping those counties together makes it a competitive district and it stays a competitive district in our map. Um, so that's part of the rationale for that district. I know. Um, some people might have wanted a more compact Bergen only district, but um, because we prioritized so heavily the idea of a ninth district with a Latino plurality, um, that wouldn't have been possible. Thanks, Bob. Um, Hannah, I was hoping you could answer this question. How many majority minority 
districts were there in 2010 and which districts are now a majority minority that were not in 2010? Yeah, great question. So in, in 2010, as I mentioned earlier, 40% of the state's population in the census was people of color. At that time, the map that was certified had one majority black district, District 10, one majority Hispanic district, District 8, and one plurality district where, where it was a majority people of color together, District 9. The rest of the districts, 75% of them, were drawn to be majority white. In the last 10 years, as we've mentioned multiple times, all of our population growth has come from people of color, which meant that two other districts have grown to become majority people of color. District 6 and District 12 are currently majority people of color, though they weren't drawn that way. Um, so our map includes all five of those districts, um, reflects what they currently are, majority people of color. It was important for us to recognize that and make sure we weren't again redrawing them to be majority white, and then adds another majority people of color district, District 11. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if anyone could take the question on the Korean American community. Um, yeah, I, I can take that. And I know maybe our map was a little bit lower resolution, so it's hard to tell. Um, Fort Lee and Palisades Park are together. Um, the Korean American community um, is kept together. Uh, that's honestly one of the really important Asian American population centers in this 11th district, which is an Asian influence district, as we've said. So um, not only do we have uh, Fort Lee, but we also have Edgewater. We also have Cliffside Park. We also have Palisades Park um, together uh, in the 11th district. Great. I'm going to combine the next two questions because I think they go well together. Uh, one is, how likely do you think that the commission will take this recommendation seriously? And the second question, which I think relates, is what can we do to support these changes? So um, I'm going to throw that open to anyone. What do people here on the panel think people can do to help make sure the commission takes this map seriously? Um, I don't know if we could put it up, but I think that the uh, the commission has uh, a, a, a link on its website um, to take comments. You do not have to be a map drawer or or submit, um, you know, a long dissertation. Um, I think people putting in um, comments to that portal saying that they support the racial equity map would go a long way to helping us, um, you know, let the commission know that. Um, people in, in, in the community, uh, people throughout New Jersey, um, see what we're doing here, agree with the principles, and, and, and support it, and that this has support from the, from the people. Thank you, Chris. Uh, also, to that point, and um, this answers one of our other questions, information about how you can get involved and how you can support this work is going to be on our website at njisj.org slash redistrictingmj. Um, you can go there and not only see our materials, if you are behind and want to see what we're presenting today, um, but also if you want to learn how you can get involved and who you can reach out to and how you can provide public testimony uh, right via writing, potentially, um, or in person once the final hearing of the redistricting commission is scheduled. Because if people don't know, there is one hearing left to be scheduled. They've scheduled nine. They're supposed to schedule 10. We are hoping that final hearing will come after they've released a draft map so we can copy on it, but we'll let everyone know when that happens. Um, another question here on the competitiveness of CD7. Philip, I feel like that's probably a you question. The panel as well. Sure, sure. I, can, I can take it and um, happy to also let Hale talk about it a little bit. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of testimony um, from lots of folks about CD7 should be should remain competitive, um, and and we took that seriously. Um, our version of the seventh is is substantially similar um, on on partisan metrics. I think it's accurate to say that it's maybe a, a a point slightly more democratic, but staying within those boundaries of keeping it a competitive district. Um, some of the slight changes on the margins, um, you know, we, we've heard testimony from folks. Um, can Scotch Plains and Fanwood be added to the seventh? We do that in this district. Um, can we, in our district, we also add Rawway. So um, a lot of these sort of Union County 
uh, towns that sort of make sense together with the rest of CD7, uh, we put in there. Um, some of the other boundaries also changed because of population equivalency. Um, but uh, essentially, we're, we're keeping the core of the 7th District the same and, and making changes to keep it the competitive district that it currently is. Um, I can answer the, at least the first part of this one, which is uh, how many people are in each district. So according to the new census, the New Jersey congressional districts are going to be uh, between 700 and 800,000 people is uh, my understanding of the number. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. Uh, I don't want you all see my fingers while I'm Googling it, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and then there's a question here specifically on CD10 and where people went from CD10. Uh, so does anyone want to speak again on congressional district 10 and sort of how that shifted and where people might have moved to? Um, I can start a little bit and then um, Philip, maybe you can discuss it. Maybe we can pull up the map a little bit so people can see it a little closely. Um, so CD10, as we mentioned, is centered around Newark. Um, and it is our majority black district, which is crucial for us to maintain and continue to have. So uh, Newark is our largest city in the state and also a majority black city. So um, it is um, the center of this district. It includes a lot of the um, majority black municipalities around Newark, Irvington, um, City of Orange, um, um, all of them are part of this district, the center of this district. It includes other communities of interest that we mentioned. Um, er um, Eric mentioned this a little while ago. Montclair, um, if you've been following the public testimony, it's a very um, um, uh, it's a very popular topic to be talking about. Do you unite it or not? And for us, we listen to the actual community there the NAACP chapter there, other community leaders, the actual black population there um, the, is that said, no, the historic black parts of Montclair want to remain in the majority black district. So that is where our Northern part of our um, district 10 is. Um, and then it goes a little South, it captures parts of Jersey city and other areas. And Philip, I don't know if you were able to share the map um, so we could see it a little bit um, or if you wanna just describe some of the other contours. There we go. Sure, so um, I'll, I'll follow up on that question. Um, great question. And actually it kind of ties into what I was just saying. So um, some of these Union County towns have moved around like you uh, correctly noted, some population had to be taken out of the existing 10th. Um, Rahway, for example, was in the 10th. Uh, Linden um, was, was all in the 10th. So we've moved some of those, we, both of those towns from CD10 uh, to CD7. The other area of population change um, would be in Jersey City. So the, the current version of the 10th district extends further into Jersey City, takes in more of that population. Um, we put a significant chunk of that into the 11th district, the 11th district um, to make that our new majority people of color district. Um, and in particular, because as we all know, there's significant um, Asian and Latino populations in, 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 in Jersey City. So now they're in, um, uh, a district that is a strong um, Asian influence district. So I hope that's that's helpful to answer that question. Thank you. Um, we have two minutes left. I'm not sure if we have time for any more questions. Uh, once again, the our panelists have all put their information in the chat. Um, so you can reach out to them individually if you have questions on any of these sorts of things. Uh, I know that people have to go and pick up kids and stuff, so I do want to, including me, so I do want to be uh, respectful of the fact that 5 p.m. is the time that we did sit out. Um, and with the final two minutes, I did want to answer, several people in the chat have said repeatedly sort of what can we do, um, or in the Q&A have said what can we do, what can we do to help support this. The first most immediate thing you can do is to know that uh, it's, this is the redistricting commission, but we also have an apportionment commission, which is going to be drawing those 40 legislative districts, the people who go to Trenton and work on the laws which affect the state of New Jersey. That commission has only done half of, or has done less than half of their meetings. Their work will be extending into the new year. And now is definitely the time to get involved. There are actually two meetings this week. Um, there's going to be a virtual hearing tomorrow at noon. Um, and then there is going to be a, a hearing at the College of New Jersey this Friday at 10 a.m. I'm gonna put in the chat uh, the information where people can register and join. Um, and then again, on our website, uh, we do have information that uh, people can look to, which is uh, njisj.org slash redistricting NJ. 
Um, so please go there if uh, if maybe. Oops, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things broadly. I know there were some questions about certain municipalities, whether they're split or not. And yes, there are municipalities split in our map as they are in the current map as undoubtedly will happen. Please keep in mind that some of the decisions that had to be made by us and will have to be made by the commission are because of equal population reasons. We need to have districts of equal population and that does create some requirements that sometimes we just have to shift, um, um, divide some towns. Um, we tried to divide towns in, in ways that best reflected the community. So when we mentioned Montclair, where, do, where, where it was split was based on those communities and where it made sense. Jersey City, we've talked about. So things like that, we really tried to be careful to do. Um, a couple of questions at, um, as was mentioned, um, yes, the shape files we're going to have on our website. You are welcome to download them and uh, look at this very closely. Uh, we, we encourage you to do that. Um, and one other thing, there has, there was some mention of certain other communities and how um, they were accounted for or how to lift them up. Please, please, we encourage you, um, as Matt mentioned, the state redistricting is still happening. Go and testify. Let's, uh, let's engage and get people to come to um, uh, and talk about their communities. The census data is limited. Um, I've, I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again here. The census tells us this, uh, um, data about who about the black population, the Hispanic population, Asian population broadly, but that doesn't account for all the diversity in the state. We don't get, for example, the significant um, Middle Eastern North African population information just from that race data. We don't get um, thoroughly our Native American indigenous population in New Jersey, which is uh, which um, is important, but it's not um, so large that we get it quite clearly. And more than that, even in the data that we have, we don't get the differences in lived experiences. There's a difference between being Black in Newark versus being Black in Maplewood versus being Black in Salem City. Your, your communities are different, your live experience is different, and you only get that if you come and tell us. Um, Amy mentioned it earlier, you are the expert of your community, so come testify so that this can be reflected. Um, and we tried to do that as best as we could in this map, um, but you know, state legislative is still happening, um, and we wanna make sure we're incorporating that and make sure the commission does too. Uh, it seems like- <laughs> Oh yeah, the panelists want to stay and answer some more questions. And so Amy, I was going to throw it over to you. Oh sure, I I just want to you know on Hennel's note about how imperfect these categories are. Look, you you know as well as we do that our communities are incredibly diverse and sit at multiple intersections of identity, right? But taking the Asian American and Pacific Islander community as an example, the fight to disaggregate that racial category started around this time after the 1990 census and was actually a multi-decade fight even prior to that. So it's your public testimony that builds the evidence for changes. You know, we know that going into the way back in 2017, 2018, 2019, we know there were these preparations and there were abandoned test questions in the census. That's what in addition to the politicization of citizenship made the citizenship question so crazy, right? Is it hadn't been tested at all. It hadn't gone through this rigorous research. So it's your testimony now in these maps um, that sort of build the record for making changes to subsequent census um, cycles that we do. So really, really important that you know where your communities live. You don't have to draw an entire map. You just need to be on record about your people, right? Because that's how we start showing up. And this space doesn't disappear after redistricting, right? The, the groups on this call have been around for many, many cycles, huge institutions that are supportive of this effort, um, but it's plugging in now that builds that pipeline for the future. And I also want to say to, to Hennel's note about the, the suit happening in Texas, you know, if there's a large amount of public testimony and you're submitting things through that portal, guess what? If we're unhappy with the map, anyone could step in and say, you know, hey, this is out of line with what things are supposed to be. So you are setting up the evidence, you are setting up the record, um, and we really encourage you to do that. Thank you, Amy. Um, Phil, did you want to make a comment on some of the town splits? Sure. Um, quickly, I, I noticed a question um, in the Q&A, um, is Lakewood split among districts? Um, yes, unfortunately, uh, Lakewood was split again. This was a, a population um, issue. Um, Lakewood is very big. Um, I will note um, when we considered how 
Um, we were gonna split Lakewood. You know, there are uh, substantial Latino populations in certain parts of Lakewood. And given that it had been part of our decision to, in the second district, include Vineland, uh, Millville Bridge, and like uh, Hennel was talking about, um, that second district, including the Latino populations in Atlantic City, um, has a, a significant um, Latino minority. So the question was, um, can we uh, put those Latino areas of, of Lakewood in with the rest of the second district? Um, uh, we did so. Um, it is, you know, we, we'd like to split zero towns, um, but uh, unfortunately that's not possible. Um, and, and that's sort of when we have to, why we made the decision we did. Any final uh, thoughts or comments from panelists? Uh, anything else that anyone else here would like to, to speak to? I'll just thank um, everybody in this coalition who is on this call and wasn't on this call um, for, for really putting in uh, an amazing effort to, to make this map. Um, and I think it's a testament to all of the organizations that, that have come together, um, that this map is getting all the support that it has. Um, so I want to, again, just reiterate that to, to everyone and to thank everybody who, who was able to join us and, and, and watch us present it. Thank you, everyone. Again, uh, information will be available at njisj.org slash redistrictingnj. I'm going to keep plugging that. Um, so if you have any further things you'd like to learn, please head there and you can hopefully learn more. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, all of our panelists, for discussing the racial equity map so eloquently. Um, and thank you, everyone here, for, for viewing. And please get involved. Please get involved. Get on the record, as everyone has said. Show up. Um, there's going to be two hearings this week you can join. So uh, go and get involved. This is a great fight to get in. Thank you.